Thank you very much, Irene. And thank you very much for inviting me. I'm obviously very sorry that this wasn't an excuse to come back to Singapore. Um, but in this age of the coronavirus pandemic, we're finding different ways to cope. So I put this presentation together. I hope that it's useful. And I wanted to talk about this question of balancing harms, navigating misinformation responses in 2020. And so for those of you that were actually at TMS last year, First Draft ran a simulation and it looked a little bit like this. It was a simulation based on a passenger uh, on a plane with measles. And we had lots and lots of content like this and it was meant to be a simulation and it was meant to be how would newsrooms react if there was a measles outbreak. And actually in January, I got this email from Kate Beddo from Google that some of you know, who basically said, um, can you please run a scenario where unicorns poop gold? This is scarily familiar. And it is true that a lot of that content that I basically created in Photoshop last year is now the kind of content we're seeing around coronavirus. And although part of me thinks that maybe I do have this ability to see into the future, I'm just really saddened by what we've seen this year, which has been an explosion of health misinformation. And so I wanted to think a little bit about harm so some of you may have seen these headlines from in August. This is just one from the BBC. Hundreds dead because of COVID-19 misinformation. And I got a lot of calls from reporters saying, Claire, Claire, tell us about uh, misinformation. And it was if lots of people suddenly cared about misinformation who hadn't before. And so on one hand, I was pleased that people were concerned. But on the other hand, I did have worries about the research. And in fact, Full Fact did a great debunk, essentially saying, hang on, this research was slightly flawed. Most of those 800 people that were cited in the research were because of alcohol poisoning deaths in Iran, which of course was terrible, but not all of that was linked to COVID. And there's, there's some questions about it. And so again, a reminder that we constantly have to be thinking about these things, even if we want to believe that it's true. So those of us who work in misinformation, oddly wanted that to be true because we wanted people to care about misinformation. That's, of course, we all have to be on our guard constantly. But what I did want to stress, again, this is from Full Fact from 2018. They called it the pagoda of harms. And actually, if you look at this, on what at the top of the pagoda, it says no harm. And then at the bottom, it says risk to life. And one thing that COVID has taught us is that clearly health misinformation is causing risk to life. I think when we talked a lot about political disinformation, people were like, yeah, it's elections, politicians, they always lie. One thing that we've seen over the last 10 months is people waking up to the fact that misinformation can be truly harmful. And so we've seen the platforms take greater steps. We've seen more money come into this field. We've saw it, seen more recognition from the mainstream media. That is all good. And so in one way, I'm glad that people are taking misinformation seriously. But, and this is a big but, just because all of this is happening and there's more concern about it, I am worried that we are sleepwalking into regulatory changes, even the way that people talk about misinformation that actually might lead to more, more harm if we're not careful. So I just wanted this keynote to really underscore the fact that we have to stay vigilant to the fact that free speech, freedom of expression is still absolutely critical to democracies and that we can't necessarily believe that because this kind of misinformation is leading to real world harm, we can take steps that might lead us into a really dangerous direction. So this is my kind of big call to arms is that we need to tread carefully. Of course, what we've seen in Hong Kong over the last few months is really, really troubling. And there's this sense of, well, in these times, these are the kind of new regulations that we need to have that's gonna really cut down on people's ability to say what they think. And it's hugely concerning. This is a recent report from the law firm Baker McKenzie, and they actually provide an overview of fake news laws in 10 Asia Pacific jurisdictions. And of course they say it's a hot topic as governments fear misinformation surrounding COVID-19. And it's true, it is worrying, but we have to be very careful that we don't allow these kind of regulations to come in without clear definitions of what we mean by harm, what we mean by dangerous speech, what we mean by problematic speech. These terms sound good, but if we don't actually create clear definitions all sorts of other speech might be affected because of it. And it's going to be very difficult to come back from that position. And the last thing I'll say is we need to test interventions. I, for one, am really pleased to see all of the major social and search companies take stronger actions around misinformation. We're seeing more labeling. We're seeing more takedowns. 
Uh, we're seeing more demotions. We're seeing more media literacy campaigns. That is great. And I am pleased with that. My only concern, and it is a huge concern, is there's no oversight on these decisions. So, for example, YouTube, great. They now add what, you know, descriptions around state media and they give different types of explanations on content. So here's the Global Times. And at the bottom of the YouTube video, it says Global Times is funding in whole or part by the Chinese government. Now, my gut instinct says, oh, this is a good thing. But I haven't tested this. I don't know. What do these labels work? What do people think when they see these labels? Are they actually clicking on those labels? Are they even recognizing these labels? Should these labels be bigger? Should these do these labels actually cause more people to say, oh, look, at this is YouTube uh, trying to make decisions on our behalf. This is a bad thing. Secondly, YouTube adds these little labels now around conspiracy theories. This is one about flat earth. If you look in tiny letters, it tells me that the flat earth model is an archaic conception of Earth's shape as a plane or disk. Again, seems like a good idea, but is every, anybody looking at this? Are they clicking on it? Is this changing anybody's minds? Is this designed to change people's minds or is this just to provide more context? We don't know unless we have independent researchers sitting with YouTube asking these questions, not about does this make people watch longer, but what does this do to the public sphere? How does this make people think about conspiracy theories? Similarly, Twitter is now taking down more content. This is from last week in Australia. Twitter permanently suspends a QAnon account. Again, part of me thinks this is a good thing. QAnon is a very worrying conspiracy. But I don't have any insight into why Twitter made this decision. They're making decisions in countries right around the world, and nobody knows why they're taking a decision. Where's the archive of the accounts they're taking down? What does it mean if you take this account down? Does it cause other accounts to blow up, or does it make other accounts um, have, be less active? There's a million research questions I have about this, and I'm not able to do that research with Twitter. I'm having to trust Twitter that they're making the right decisions. Well, I don't feel overly comfortable about that. And, and here's an example from Instagram and Facebook. Uh, this is actually footage from last August in Hong Kong. It resurfaced in March and Boom Live in India did a really good fact check and um, actually said, oh, you know, this is old content. Uh, this is actually from August 2019. This is anything to do with coronavirus. But this is Lok Van Su on Twitter. He's saying, well, my students were posting this old footage about Hong Kong on their Instagram accounts. And it got flagged because the machine learning algorithm was like, oh, we know that this is false. We're going to say it's false. Well, that was genuine footage. Remember, the most common type of content we see is genuine footage used out of context. And so when you click on why, it tells you, oh, you know, Boom Live said this was false. Well, it's not. It was genuine content. And so Boom Live had to put out a tweet to say, we're aware that our fact check on a video from Hong Kong is incorrectly being applied to flag several posts on Instagram. We have to remain vigilant as the platforms rely on more um, machine learning, artificial intelligence to do this kind of content moderation and to add flags to demote content. We have to be really vigilant in this community to understand what those decisions are and what the impact is, because we talk all the time about the platforms having unintended consequences about their decisions. We also have to be aware that some of the things that make us feel good, like, oh, a label, that's a good thing. Is it a good thing? We don't know. We have to do the research. And just this weekend, Donald Trump in the U US uh, was tweeting incorrectly about voting. And this is the thing that Twitter added that says uh, Twitter rules. Um, this violates our civic and election integrity rules. Um, but we've determined that it can remain up. And if I click view, I can still actually see uh, the tweet. Is this a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Is this causing more people to try and click on it and to find it than they would have done previously? Does this mean more newsrooms are reporting on it and therefore giving it more oxygen? There are so many questions that we have about all of these things. So I would just leave you by saying, yes, more things are happening in this space. That is a good thing, but it's only good if we are working with the platforms to research what the consequences are of these decisions. And we need to remain vigilant when governments are making decisions, which again might make us feel like, oh, this is a good thing. They're taking false speech seriously, but always think about what are these unintended consequences? Because in five years time, we might look back and say, hang on, we made mistakes. We didn't realize at the time, we thought we were doing the right thing, but actually we've caused more harm. Oh, and this is the Facebook example, which uh, didn't take it down, but added another um, label. So uh, that's the end. Thank you very much for your time. And um, 
I hope that you really enjoy this virtual TPM. Uh, let's stay in contact. Let's carry on working together. That's the one thing that I'm most sad about, that we're not all together. That was the joy of Singapore last year.